In landscape photography, there are often little defects, little glitches, little gotchas, these things that sneak into your image that cause the viewer's eye to be distracted, that lead the, the viewer's eye away from what it is that you want to be focusing on. And it's actually quite similar to portrait photography, where portrait photographers often have to contend with things like acne and wrinkles and uneven skin tone, that kind of stuff. And this practice of cleaning up images, in my opinion, really isn't like, you know, the goal here really isn't to create a more perfect image, to create a perfect landscape, because I think when things get too perfect, then it starts to look a little like, you know, like you created it with mid journey or something like that. It's AI generated. It starts to look a little phony, a little bit fake, and it just doesn't feel quite right. I think the trick is knowing, you know, when to stop and just focusing on major things, focusing on, you know, some of the, the most notable things that are drawing your eye that are draw that are making you crazy. For example, this image that I'm going to show you here, uh, this is one that I took recently out in Utah, and I actually shared this in a recent video. If you want to know more about this particular image, I talked quite a bit about this image, the creation of this image and other landscape images from that trip. But one of the things that I noticed afterwards when I came back and I started editing this image was this area of discoloration on this rock uh, here in the foreground. And it's the kind of thing that just looks wrong. Like there's clearly something that's just a little bit off with it. And fixing that, in my opinion, doesn't really change the character of the image. It doesn't alter or um, or distort reality or anything like that. I mean, we're basically just cleaning something up. We're touching it up and just making things just a little bit nicer. Now, if you use Photoshop, I'm sure you're probably aware that Adobe added a new remove tool to Photoshop, which is pretty cool. I mean, I've used it uh, on a number of images. It's basically like content aware fill in a brush. You just paint over whatever it is that's annoying, whatever that little glitchy thing is. But in my experience, the thing that I've that I've learned about the remove tool over the past year is that even though like sometimes it can do pretty amazing things, it's not perfect all the time, which is OK, right? I mean, none of us are, um, you know, I mean, these things happen. But oftentimes, in my experience, the remove tool is not the right tool for the job. The remove tool can actually cause more problems, can actually make an image worse <laughs> rather than better, which is clearly you know, not what we want. For example, let me just quickly show you what the remove tool would do uh, to this particular area here that I was talking about in this photo. And let's just draw over this area and uh, let's just let Photoshop have a go with it and see what it does. Well, it definitely removed the blue. It definitely removed some of that discoloration. But notice also what it's done here. It's It's repeated some of the patterns that it found like around that area and I can you know toggle this on and off and you can see that it really kind of you know honed in on this particular area right here and just repeated that pattern across and the results just look kind of weird I mean it's almost worse now because now your eyes is, <laughs> is drawn to a repeated to a repeating pattern the eye has a has a habit of looking for patterns and so this is this is totally not going to work now, I could, if I wanted to, use the clone stamp tool and just, you know, clone whatever is next to it. And, you know, oh, that's pretty terrible. Um, <laughs> you get the idea, right? You know, I could use clone stamp and that's one way to do it. But again, you oftentimes end up with those repeating patterns and it still doesn't look quite right. What I really want to do here, I really just want to fix this color. So what we can do to fix this is uh, use an old technique known as frequency separation. And frequency separation has been around a long, long time. I think it's been around almost as long as Photoshop itself. Sometimes uh, what's old is actually better. And frequency separation is still one of the most effective tools that you can use to clean up problems like this with uneven color. And you can also use it to clean up uneven texture as well. So to do frequency separation, I'm going to use uh, an action. I have a couple of actions here, an 8-bit version and a 16-bit version. These actions are free, by the way. I've put them up on Google Drive. You can download them and import them into, into Photoshop and do the exact same thing that I'm doing here. So because this is a 16-bit image, and by the way, you can tell by coming up here and looking at this number at the end of the, of the file name in this tab, or you can go to Image, Mode, and here you will see uh, how many bits you're cur currently working in. So this is 16 bits. So I'm going to select the 16 bit action, I'm going to hit the play button. And then you are going to see this modal window here for Gaussian blur. Now this is a really important step. Basically what's happening here is that this Gaussian blur effect is going to separate 
the color information in the image from the texture and the detail in the image. The color and tonal information in the image is a low frequency, whereas the detail and the texture is a high frequency. And that's what we mean by frequency separation. It takes your image, it takes your flat image and separates the details and the textures from the color and the tones in the image so that you're able to work on each independently. And the Gaussian blur is the key. The Gaussian blur is the, the tool that separates uh, one from the other. So generally speaking, what you want to do here is you want to set your Gaussian blur to a number where you no longer see some of the fine detail and texture, but you still see some of the shapes. You still see some of the structure and and um, and outlines of everything. You, you really want to just see the color and the tonality, not the fine detail. Now, this number I generally find I usually set this somewhere between like um, I usually set the radius of this to somewhere between like 8 and 15, 20, something like that. The radius number is going to be dependent on the resolution of your image and the, the number of megapixels that you that your camera uh, has. Generally speaking, the higher the megapixels, uh, the more pixels you have, the, the higher the radius number needs to be. And a good general like rule of thumb to, to like get in your mind is that generally the radius should be right around like about a third of your megapixels. So if you're shooting with say a 25 megapixel camera, something like that, you would set the radius to around eight or 10. Um, and maybe a little bit higher if you're using a higher resolution camera, uh, like I do with the with the Fuji GFX. But that's not a hard and fast rule. Sometimes you know, it's all dependent on the particulars of the image that you're editing. But generally speaking, that's that's what you're aiming for. Okay, so now I have my frequency separation layer here. Let's come over here to the little area of discoloration in this rock here. And I'm going to select the low frequency layer. Now again, low frequency, those are the colors and the tones, but not the textures. Now there are a number of different tools you can use on this low frequency layer uh, to fix color if you want to. You can use the clone stamp tool, you could use the patch tool. You can actually use the remove tool uh, as well if you want to give that a try. But whichever tool you select, you want to make sure uh, that you have uh, your sample set to current layer, not these other options here. You want it to be current layer. So we're just working, working on the low frequency layer. And for this image, the clone stamp tool, I think, is the right way to go. So similar to using the clone stamp tool in general, going to sample an area that's nearby with the color that I want. So let's sample this little area right here. And then I'm going to paint over that area. I'm going to decrease the brush size a little bit. It's getting a little, little hard to control. And just going to keep sampling that area over there, drawing into these areas, maybe do this one too. And as you can see, it is painting that color underneath the texture. I'm not affecting the texture at all because the texture has been cleanly separated onto its own layer, onto that high frequency layer. And that looks very natural. That looks very believable. Uh, you wouldn't know that <laughs> you wouldn't know that anything was changed there. And by the way, we can keep going here. And one, and one of the things I would recommend doing is just when doing this kind of stuff, just follow the grain of whatever it is that you're editing. Like, for example, this little patch of orange here, it kind of feels like it wants to go here, like it wants to fill in this area. Maybe it was there at some point, but it flaked off or something. Well, I can select that brighter orange color and I can come in here and paint it into here in order to extend some of that and so on. So we can keep going here, but let me just toggle the layer on and off. And yeah, you can see just, <laughs> you can see how much of a difference it's, it's really making. It's, it's a pretty incredible, pretty powerful technique that you can use. Okay, but what can we do with the high frequency layer, the layer that contains our details and our textures? What can we do with that? Well, we can actually do the exact same thing that we did with low frequency channel by using the clone stamp tool and we can copy the detail and texture from one area of the image onto another. Now, let's just say, for example, in this area here, notice how this area up here looks a little bit flat. 
Uh, it's, it's lacking a little bit in color too, but let's just focus on texture for the moment. And let's say that we want to bring up some of this texture from down here. Well, again, we select the high frequency layer, use the clone stamp uh, tool, make sure that you're set to current layer up here in sample. Might want to check your opacity and flow settings as well to make sure that they're at 100%. And then I'm just going to sample this area down here and then clone it into this top section up here above. And you can see that, yeah, we're getting a little bit of repeating pattern here, like this shape here and this shape here are showing up up here as well. But really what I'm trying to do is just establish a better baseline, just something better to be working with so that, you know, if I really wanted to, I could merge my layers and I could flatten this and then I could go in and, you know, with the remove tool and just fix that little part there. Okay, so let's do a quick little before and after here. So that is the before and that is the after. And as you can see, it's just, you know, just some little subtle changes here and there. And I think the difference is, is pretty obvious. I think, you know, as you can see, I think it works really, really well. Now, one other thing I want to show you here, if we back out and let me just show, uh, show you an example of something where high frequency just isn't worth uh, the effort. Like, let, let's take this area right here. So let's say that we want to fix this. Well, I could select low frequency, again, use the clone stamp, and I could draw into here. And you can see that it just doesn't look quite right. Like it looks a little bit milky. It looks, you know, there's something about that brighter blue being injected into there that, that just doesn't look correct. And it doesn't look correct because the texture is missing because this area lacks texture. So all we're doing is just copying um, the color, which in the case of the, the orange rock a minute ago was perfectly fine, but here it looks a little bit weird. So I can then select high frequency, uh, sam sample the same area, and then draw the texture in like so. And that works, but Remember that frequency separation is separating a flat image into two separate channels, the colors and the textures. And if you find yourself using both the low frequency and the high frequency layer to make some kind of edit, well, you're effectively doing the same thing that you would normally do if, let me just create a merge layer here, that you would normally do with the clone stamp tool by itself, not even using frequency separation. Like, you know, when I'm doing this with the clone stamp tool on a merge layer, I am, you know, I am cloning this area over here, both the color and the texture together. So if you find yourself, you know, doing both within frequency separation, it's probably not an ideal area for it. Really, the, the key to thinking about frequency separation is thinking about that, that separation of color and texture from one another and use it in areas where it makes sense to do so. Otherwise, you know, just use clone stamp or use something else. Uh, in order to achieve the same effect that you would otherwise get when editing both the high and the low frequency layers. So I think a little goes a long way. I mean, trust me, I could put my headphones on and spend an entire day just going through and you know balancing colors and getting the tonality of everything just right. But remember that the further you go, the less authentic the image is going to get and the more perfect the image is going to look. Like if I went nuts here and just painted that same tone of orange all over that rock, well, eventually the, the rock would look like it was painted. Like it would look like I just went out there with a brush and just painted over the whole thing. So you want some anomalies, right? I mean, you want there to be some organic, you know, just um, something that isn't quite uniform because when things are too uniform, it just, it doesn't, it begins to look a little too synthetic, I think. You know, that's just my opinion. Everyone's going to have a different opinion. Everyone draws the line in different places, but that's how I approach it. When something is just notably wrong, when something just sticks right out, just jumps off the screen at me, I know that I need to go in and, and fix it, which, and frequency separation is a great tool for that. If you would like to download the 8-bit and 16-bit frequency separation actions that you saw me using in this video, you may do so. They're absolutely free. They're a link down below in the video description. When you get them, put them in some kind of local folder. I tend to keep these types of things in Dropbox so I can access them from both you know my desktop and my laptop, and then just import them into your actions panel and you're good to go. And then you can just run those actions and then do your own frequency separation work uh, on your own images. So that's it, everyone. Thanks so much for being here. If this video was helpful and you learned something from it, please take a moment and give it a thumbs up down below. And if you want to hang out with me again in the future and do this again, remember to subscribe as well. See you in the next one.